We want to say welcome to those who join us very, via video, and I always a reminder, we'd love to have you here with us in the congregation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak to us today through your word. Father God, you have already brought your presence into this place and has been manifest in our time of song, in our time of fellowship, in our time of prayer. But Lord God, we are sitting down today waiting for you to speak to us through your precious word. I pray for an anointing upon me as I speak, an anointing upon us all, Lord God, as we hear and take to heart the word. All these things I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Today we're going to participate in communion. I know that when you think of communion, several different denominations look at it in several different ways, and they look at how, how often they take it in different ways, and and the definitions, and who can take communion, who cannot take communion, all of these other things that go back and forth. But we practice an open table. We welcome all of those who've accepted Jesus Christ to the table. The table is a, is a meeting place. There, there's a meeting at the, at the table, at the communion table, as we call it. There's a meeting at this table between God and man. It's a place where we come together. And as I began to think about that and began to pray about that, I'm, of course, reminded that Christ himself initiated the ordinance of communion at the Last Supper. He was gathered around the table. And if you remember, you see the pictures all the time, and they probably weren't even at a table. They were probably sitting reclining on the, on the floor but in the picture, you can always imagine that there was, was Christ, God himself there. And around the table were these 12 men that he called his friends. The God of the universe is there. And around him are all these different people made up of so many different things. And I began to look, I said, there were fishermen, there were tax collectors, they were troublemakers, they were braggers. There were some that were quick for a fight, some were sure of themselves, some were sure of nothing and one who would deny him, and one that would sell him out. We come together today as a diverse group, different backgrounds. We've all come to Christ in different ways. We all have different testimonies. I, I love the, the lesson that says, if all your friends look like you, if all your friends think like you, if all your friends even believe like you, then it's time to get a new group of friends. You used to say all the time, too, if you're the smartest one in your group, you need a new group. <laughs> I'm just saying. And Jesus gave us that as an example with the people that he surrounded himself with continually. In this list of those who are around the table with Jesus, I couldn't find any Pharisees, Sadducees, any priests, any lawyers of the law. I couldn't find them there. He came out and he went with the normal people. He told us early in his ministry, he said, who needs a doctor but the sick? He knew that it was those those that were, that were going to come to him, were going to be called to him and respond to him, were those in desperate need of a Savior. What if someone like, some, what if someone in your inner circle, your group of friends, maybe if someone in your group betrays you? What if they let you down? It's going to happen. We see that in Christ and those that he picked. And what do you do? You do what he did. You love them. You forgive them. And the most important thing is you never regret inviting them. When you've invited someone to the table, whatever happens, never regret inviting them to the table. I've said over all the years, whenever somebody buys a new house, somebody begins to go shopping for furniture, whenever you go shopping for a dining room table, always buy a table bigger than you need. Always buy a table big enough to include others. And we, church, we have to be the same way. When we begin to do anything for this church, anything for this building, it's always with the intent of invitation and room for others. When we do anything on the parking lot or the seating or anything that we do, everything is with the fact that we're allowing room to make comfortable those that we will invite. You know, it's a simple fact that you can almost look at it. They say that up to 60, 70 percent of the people that you invite to church will actually come if they don't have a home church. They said it goes up even higher if you volunteer to go pick them up or volunteer to take them out to eat afterwards. But I will tell you this, it's pretty most close to zero that zero percent of those that you do not invite will not come to church. 
It's not something that they just fall into. You bring them in, you invite them, and maybe they disappoint you. But you never regret having invited them. You wash their feet. You share your table with them. Will people disappoint you? Yes, they will. Let me tell you, people will disappoint you. News alert, you have disappointed someone in your life. I'm sorry, it's a fact. You have disappointed someone, and in return, someone will at some point disappoint you. Because when we look at Christ coming into the table, the communion, there's only one at the table that never disappoints. Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, put it this way in 1 Peter 2.22. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. What an unusual word. He never sinned, but he also never deceived anyone. There was within him no hypocrisy. What you saw is what you get, what you got. Whenever Jesus, who told Judas, go do what you must do, he'd already told them, one of you at this table is going to betray me tonight. And they all asked the one. And Jesus said, one of you at the table will betray me. What was the question that they all asked? Is it me? Not which one. Is it me? They suspected themselves over Judas. Jesus knew because when Judas got up, Jesus told him, he said, what? Go do quickly that thing which you must do. But whenever they all came in, Jesus did what? He washed their feet. He welcomed them in. He had them around his table. And I believe that there was always an out, even for Judas. But this evening, when they all came together, they came together, it was a holiday. You understand that? They were celebrating Passover, to celebrate the chance. The, the, the night before the, the Israelites were able to leave Egypt. It's a point of celebration. They come together. How often do you come together with your family at that one point? You know, it was a celebration. You come together. They were eating. They were drinking. They were giving as merry men, as we sometimes read in the scriptures. They were rejoicing together. A, a wonderful thing that had happened, a point of celebration. But Jesus brought into it a, a little bit of a somber mode as well. Because he knew that in there, in the seeing, the fact that at the Passover, a lamb was sacrificed and the blood was placed upon the doorpost of the homes. And by that blood of the lamb, everyone in the home was saved. And Jesus knew specifically, and was hoping it would finally click with his people, that that's exactly what is fixing to happen. He told them three times that he would be crucified, but they never let it actually sink in. He was showing them in the midst of the supper they came together. He showed them a path from slavery to a place of promise and a place of purpose. That's what happened in the whole story of the Passover. Whenever the Israelites left Egypt, that's what it was. They moved from slavery to a place of purpose and promise. Every one of you here that has accepted Jesus Christ have been given permanent residence in a place of purpose and a place of promise. Now, I don't know what your purpose is. That is between you and God to be able to work out why he has you here. I do know that you've been given one command. We've stressed it for months, is that you're to go into all the world and preach the gospel. In Sunday school, we're going over that over and over and over again. The little books we got in the back, that's good news. We're stressing that. That's one thing that's part of your, pope, your purpose. As they gathered around the table of sharing food and drink, they found as many things in common as they could. Jesus spoke specifically to them about the bread that was there. The most common thing that they had was that every day there was some bread in their lives. He spoke to them about the wine. The wine was always there somewhere within their lives. And it was similar whenever Jesus sat down with them as when Jesus sat down with the woman at the well. And I've told you this over and over and over again, but eventually it's going to set in with us. That whenever Jesus sat at the woman in the well, they found something in common. And the one thing they found in common is the one thing that covers 78% of the earth or whatever it is. It's water. They found something. She came needing water, and he came there to deliver water to her. It was a meeting of those who had a purpose, both of them, that led him to offering her the living water, which in the living water means she never had to be thirsty again. It reminded me... It reminded me of a story of a, a dear friend of mine. Pulled up at my house late one night, blew the horn. At this time, I didn't know who he was. He pulled up into my driveway and he blew the horn. I recognized his truck. He was from across the street. We'd never actually met. I went and looked. Here's a big, all I see is a big old cowboy hat. He rolls out in the window. And I said, yes, sir. He said, get in the truck. You know what I did? I got in the truck. I said, Okay. We'll, we'll, be all, we'll be all right. Marcy's looking through the window. I think she'll eventually figure out if I don't come back. He said, get in the truck. 
We were very, very opposite. This man was the embodiment of John Wayne. He looked like John Wayne. He was tall like John Wayne, kind of talked like John Wayne, had a big old cowboy hat everywhere he went. He ended up becoming a dear friend of mine that I actually thought of his family. He was Dennis Hooker. He worked at the tractor place there in Bunky. He lived across the road from me, and what happened was he would just go ahead and take his shower when he got off of work, hard day's work, would turn on the shower, and it was just dribbling out. Water pressure was low. He's like, oh, no. So he come and got me. I'm like, oh, what well, I'm supposed to do. He said, get in the truck. And we drove up and down the road looking for the water leak. We were on city water. And sure enough, we found it. So we could call him and not just call him and say, hey, my water is low. I got low pressure. I was going to do nothing. He so actually get someone and said, look, you got a major leak. And they were able to fix it. So we found something in common that night driving down the road. It was simply like the woman at the well. It was water. And after that point, he became one of my best friends, a dear friend that I consider to be family to each other. At the end, I ended up becoming his pastor, and I ended up officiating his funeral that happened at way too young of an age because it knew that my friend that I made that connection with over water, we would never be separated even in death. Find one thing in common with someone. Start the conversation that may lead to their conversion. You don't know what the conversation is that could lead to the fact when you have these God moments. We're talking in Sunday school, and we mentioned ping, P-I-N-G, and what does it stand for? Power and noticing God. God. That's actually the book after That's Good News that my friend, Pastor Shane Bishop, wrote. Ping, P-I-N-G, power and noticing God. How often do things happen, and maybe we just fail to notice that God is in the midst? We call them what? God moments, right? Power and noticing God. There's power in that. If we're willing to look for it, we find those situations. The book that we're reading is for us to overcome those fears. You understand it's, over, it's, it's possible to have fear in, in speaking to a stranger. I understand that. But we can overcome that. The Holy Spirit says it gives us that power and, 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 and that boldness that we all need. It comes to us in sharing our testimony. How many of you know what that means? Sometimes it's a fancy word, and sometimes we speak in Christianese in the church. We have our own language. But testimony is just like that whenever you have to go to court and you have to testify. And you're just saying what you saw and what you heard. That's it. You don't have to embellish it. What did you see and what did you hear? Tell me that what? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You can't get any more truth than this. Tell them, let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you what Jesus has done to me. They want to know what Jesus means to you. I'm about two years into writing a book. I'm at the point now, some of the chapters have been edited, and I've got people that know a lot more than me, and they're reviewing the sections and coming back with things. And a lot of times what they'll come back with this is, it's hard for me to say, this is great, but we need, we need to tie that to you, one of your stories, to make it you know, uh, to be able to relate to others. I'm like, I'd much rather find someone else's story. I'm, I'm not one that likes to tell my own story. And I really don't like to tell other people's story because I want them to tell their stories. It's the same way it's for us to be able to tell our stories and get those words out. Tell them where you were and how you got to where you are now. The power of your testimony, what Jesus has done in your life. On Wednesday nights at the other church, I'm preaching a Bible study on I Am a Church Member. And years ago, we actually went through that book in Sunday school with um, Tom Rainer's book, I Am a Church Member. What does it mean to be a church member? And luckily, the two overlap really well because it means that if I'm a church member, I have expectations. And I asked the class Wednesday, what does it mean? What are the expectations we should have on church members? And they said, well, they, they attend. I said, there you go. That's a good one. You've got to show up. Uh, they give tithes. I said, that's good. Uh, they participate in church events. I said, that's wonderful. That's great. I said, that's all things right in here. I said, but what about outside the walls? I said, there's an expectation that they should share the gospel and they should invite others to come in here. That's how it works. That's an expectation that comes upon us. There's an overlapping between church membership and evangelism. I love what um, Pastor Bishop said. He said in the book, it says, says, evangelism is the reproductive system of the body of Christ. Without a clear focus upon it and strategy and excitement around it, every existing church is in a death cycle. The book, that's good news. That's what we're reading. He says that in there. 
Evangelism is a reproductive system of the church. That is how we grow. That's how we as members add members. We have more members than we had last year, and hopefully next year we'll have more members than we have this year. And the opportunity exists. If you haven't joined this church, let me know today. We have some new members that have joined, and we're going to recognize them in the weeks to come. But if you haven't, today's a good day to be able to fill out a card and say, I want to be a church member. That's how we grow. And most of those who have come has become a member of this church, invited them to come to this church. Now, I will say I'm a member of the church too, and I've invited some people, and they have came, and I'm happy for that. That's how we grow and how we multiply. We make those connections between people. The, the business work talks about networking, that we're always connecting to this person and this person. We make the connection between people who are great sinners, but they're in need of a Savior who's a great Savior. No matter what your sins are, God is able to be able to manage that. Charles Spurgeon preached a message years ago and said, A great gospel for great sinners. And in that gospel, he quoted what Paul had to say in 1 Timothy. Paul said, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he says, I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners, then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. We know, if you know the life of Paul, Paul was there doing everything he could to kill Christians. That's what he did. That was his job. And he was very proud of his job, and apparently he was very good at his job. But even him, as one who was called to kill Christians, God saw within him his zeal and his fervor. And called him in, and he accepted Christ to be his Savior. God was able to save even Paul. I don't know what you have done. I don't know what your sins are, but there is nothing that's created a chasm so wide between you and God that we cannot make that up. You say, well, I found Christ. That's wonderful. Share that testimony with someone else. In the midst of everything, you have man who is totally depraved, standing here on one side of this gulf, And over here you have God who is completely without sin, the omniscient leader of the whole world, worthy worthy of nothing but eternal praise. And over here is a man who is worthy of nothing but eternal death. How do we bridge between the two? Someone was needed to bridge that gap, and we know that that was Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God In Him. You do know when you realize that Jesus was fully man and fully God. Will you ever understand that? No. The Bible says, lean not on your own understanding. In the natural, you will never understand how Jesus was fully man and fully God. You can spend the rest of your life, I'm telling you, you'll never fully fully grasp it. Because if you can think with the mind of God, then you know what? He's not God. If you can ever understand God, then He is not God. You've created your own God, perhaps, but you've not ever in the natural been able to fully understand God. Jesus, this fully God and fully man, was the only way that we've ever found to be able to bridge the gap, to bring these two things that were separated and that could not in any way join themselves otherwise. The only thing that connect man to God, again, and I got to begin to thinking about that, uh, you, you realize you can, you, the things that you were born into, you never fully leave. And I've never fully lost my, my redneck roots. Because when I'm beginning to think and read about all this, I had Johnny Cash going through my mind. And I got to thinking, what are we going to do? How are we going to connect God and man? And you know what we need between the two? We need an adapter kit. I mean, you know when Johnny Cash sung about an adapter kit, right? One piece at a time. Piece at a time. Yeah, I should have got the radio man there. And if my TV ever worked again, I've actually got a picture of it, and it may come back up again. But in that one piece at a time. And the purpose of the adapter kit was actually so we could put together a 1953 transmission to a 1973 engine. 
how I'm going to put a 53 transmission to a 73 transmission. I have to have an adapter kit. And yes, I know that's not how it's pronounced, but I'll always default to Johnny Cash. Jesus was that missing piece. Jesus was that adapter kit that connected us back to God. He connected two things that would not change. You understand that? Jesus connected two things that would not change. The will of God. The will of God will not change. Period. And he connected that to a man who was born in original sin, totally and completely depraved, and unable to change himself. Do you understand that? You talk about all these people and you complain about these people and say, oh, I can't believe it this one. You've got to at some point realize they cannot change themselves. Jesus said you are doing the work of your father, the devil. They cannot on their own change. You say, oh, well, they can be good people. Bad. I'm not talking about good people, bad people. I'm talking about lost people and saved people. They cannot do anything to change that. And I went to the hardware store yesterday because there's only one thing I could come in. I never could find the one I wanted. But this is what's called a union. I mean, not those of you who are pipe fitters. But what it, what it does, a union gives the availability to join this pipe to this pipe, but yet neither of them have to turn. It brings them together, and it does all of the work. Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus in his sufficiency of the cross did all of the work. He brought God and man together in the only way that would ever work. You say, oh, it won't work, it won't work, it won't work. Yes, it will work. Will it work in the mind of man? No. Lean not on your own understanding. It is a common union is what happens there. That is where we get our communion from. We see that it was brought together by the blood and by the body of Christ Jesus. It brought together two totally and completely different things. We don't have a lot of workplace unions here in the South. Anybody here ever been a member of a union? We, we don't have a lot of that in, in the South. But the original purpose, the way that it should be, is to provide as a liaison between the employer and the employees. But in that scenario, it's expected that everyone is going to give something up, right? They come to what's known as the negotiating table. There is no negotiation at the communion table. God is not going to move. God is not going to waver. You, in your natural man, are not going to move and you're not going to waver. But when you are brought into the body of Christ, it says you are made a new creation. Old man has passed away. Behold, all things are made new. The man you were, the woman you were here, no, they can never be joined. But when through Christ Jesus, joined in the body and brought into the body of Christ Jesus, here at the communion table, we see that union between God and man once again restored. The Apostle Paul put it this way when he began to look at how we can begin to not negotiate, but instead mediate, which is two totally different things. He told us this, he said, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus. All man and all God. Like I said, the unions use the negotiating table to work things out, but both expect, sides are expected to give things up. In the communion table, God gave up only one thing. He gave up his son. We see that in John 3.16. He in no way varied who he was or what he was. But he said, I'm going to give you part of me. That's all I can do. And whenever he gave up his son, we in turn to give up our lives, give up who we were. The table is that culmination of the works of evangelism that are shared in the midst of us, fulfilling what it means to be a church member, growing bodies, that we come together and partake as one body. And I ask you this morning, you that are here and everyone that is watching online, have you partaken of those two things? Have you partaken of Jesus Christ and in the communion that comes us together? And have you partaken of church membership? It's important that we are joined together as a body. We celebrate in communion today the fact that we are a common union formed between God and us. But you know what? It's also between us and one another. We join around the table together. We are one body. Each of you has an important thing to do within this 
within this church. But also each of you are called to be able to evangelize. I offer both today. If you haven't joined the body of Christ by accepting Jesus Christ, then I want you to do that today. If you haven't joined this church as a member, or if you're watching online, if you haven't joined your church where you are, because I'm not here to steal a sheep, today is the day. Accept Jesus Christ. And the day is the day to be able to join into a body. To be a member of a body is very important to us. Jesus gave us that as an example. So if you wish to do either of those today, please find me today. If you would now, the communion table is open for you to come and receive the elements. As you come forward, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 27 to 32, because we do not partake of communion lightly. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're told, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number have died. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord. So we will not be condemned along with the world. We're to drink of the wine and eat of the bread because we have realized that in there is the sanctity of Christ Jesus. If there is something that is blocking you, then now is the time to be able to pray. You can pray right where you are. That God would do as David prayed. David prayed, Lord God, search me. See if there be within me any wicked way. And if there is, there's absolutely no shame in taking that communion cup, slipping it in your purse or in your pocket to a later time when you have worked out what you needed to and come to full repentance before God. It may be that there is someone that you need to go to in a midst of repentance and forgiveness. You need to forgive them or they need to forgive you. There is no shame in delaying taking of the elements until that has been done. Lord God, today we ask you to search our hearts. Reveal any sins which we must confess. Heavenly Father, on the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Father God, I ask your blessing upon this bread. Father God, as we see it as a symbol of the body of Christ broken for us. Lord God, we proclaim, Lord God, today that in this body of Christ Jesus, Lord God, we come together as one body, united Not as the broken body of Christ upon the cross, but as the united body of Christ, living and proclaiming the word forever. Then Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Let us eat. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks to you, O Lord. Father God, for this we give thanks for the body of Jesus Christ was broken. And Lord God, this for his blood that was shed. We see, Lord God, within there the completeness of salvation. Father God, by the sacrifice made complete, the body broken and the blood shed. Father God, we only come before you and stand holy because we are 
washed by the blood of the Lamb. Father God, we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We've accepted, Lord God, as you passed over the houses in the Passover, when you saw the blood. Lord God, so with us, you will pass over and withhold your wrath because you see the very blood of Christ upon us. We pray your blessing upon this. And Jesus said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Let us drink. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Please stand. Father God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, that we would be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Join with me. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go forth in the glory and the admonition of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.